there was a need for port authorities to have perhaps closer discussions together with the ship operators. There are many challenges we are facing, and of course one of the biggest challenges which you alluded to earlier on was the arrival of the larger ships. So if this dialogue were to take place between the port authorities and the shipping community, what do you think should be discussed? And how would it make a difference? Thank you. I think my intimate concern is that with a bigger ship, you need a new set of uh, facility to take care of the big ship. The big ship, in the sense that it is now currently much longer. And traditionally, if you have a terminal that has three berths, today you can only accommodate two ships instead of three. And because the ships are bigger, so the, the boxes, the cargo that's arriving is probably in two ships more than three ships in the old days, and it comes in one very short slot of time. So the terminal must be able to know how to manage without any uh, hiccup. And if they are not, then I think you will see very substantial delays. And with big ships, you need a set of network feeder ship to satisfy the load for the big ship so that in the operation, the feeder ship and the mother ship schedule is well coordinated and if you have congestion you have delayed then you create dislocation in your system which is a not good for customer and not good for your cost so in that sense I think we need to see uh, the terminals to actually continue their investment and keep pace with the changes of today's operating environment and to the extent that they require ports support to provide more land, to build more infrastructure, to cater to the bigger ships, then I think the port authority should actually also sit on the table to discuss these changes that's coming to us. And that's very important to the efficiency operation, uh, not only for the shipping company, but also for the port and terminals. One of, one of the factors uh, you mentioned in increasing efficiency is the alliances. And you talked also about perhaps extending the alliances to the land side. What about M&A? Are you looking to buy anybody at the moment? <laughs> and uh, how, how should M&A work in the container industry? Uh, is it going to help? Can it help? I think if you look at the history over the last, let's say, 20, 25 years, uh, a number of M&A deal has been done. You know? Although I think, compared with the other industry, uh, I think our M&A exercise has been you know, uh, progressing in a very, very slow pace. You know? In certain uh, aspect, it's because uh, a good number of companies today is controlled by families and then also controlled by national government. So in the sense that people that is interested in acquiring, maybe there is no target to be acquired. Uh, or people interested to be acquired, they may not be you know, able to find somebody that has the capacity, both financially or operationally, to take over. Because we're talking about merging two company probably have very distinct corporate culture and usually of different nationality then you have difference in ethnic culture and it is not easy to put them together and uh, function effectively. Do you think it would work from a capacity point of view or actually the alliances are enough in terms of trying to rationalize? I, I, I think certainly alliance is enough on the ship side but on the shore side the merger or acquisition approach would be would make more sense. Thank you, Mr. C.C. How are you? <laughs> How are you? Uh, you mentioned about uh, operational efficiency uh, and uh, operational cost. Over the years, uh, 
the industry has achieved uh, improvements in both areas by focusing on people, systems, or processes, and technology. And what it has achieved is incremental improvements. Can you envision any breakthroughs in improvements in operational efficiency and operating cost uh, in a transformational way rather than an incremental way? I think if one look at operation costs, I think we have to also examine the external condition. External condition meaning uh, financial market, cost of money that affects your capital costs, uh, oil price that affects your bunker costs, terminal, whether you are able to invest, and the cost of investment is very high, and if you do invest, you are able to build volume so that your unit costs will come down. And your land transportation, in the sense that if you are able to uh, depend on your operating system to really know where everything is, it will allow you to operate efficiently. So the external environment, if you look at it back in 70s and 80s, certainly the interest cost is a lot higher. So therefore, <clears throat> your financial cost will be higher. So the capital cost element within your total operating cost structure is reasonably high. Reasonably high, I would say roughly somewhere between 20, 23% of your total operating cost. And back in those days, you were having probably $100 a ton bunker. The bunker cost is probably 9 to 10% of your total cost structure. Yeah. And today, or rather, let's say six months ago, when bunker is $600 a ton, the bunker cost for a voyage from Asia to Europe would be as high as 30% of your total operating cost while your capital cost came down to about 11 and 12%. So the external environment is very important as to how and what emphasis you put on in terms of managing your costs. And of course, the terminal cost is about 24, 25% of your total cost. And the short side transportation is about the same, about 25%. So these are roughly the cost component of a container line. I think what's interesting about that point is how it shifts over time and actually it hasn't stopped shifting. So we could see a scenario where interest rates come back up again and uh, bunker costs have come down recently but could go up again. So one needs to build the business to be resilient uh, to those. And to that's those why resources. our business is so interesting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Variables. Yes, there's another question uh, over here. Yes. So Chris Jones from the, uh, the Baltic Exchange in Singapore. Good afternoon. Um, I don't go back quite as far in shipping as your good self. And I think when um, I was a lad in shipping uh, the um, post uh, or the, uh, the transatlantic container vessels and the trans-Pacific size was about 2,000 TU. So we're going to harp on about size again. And um, to quote that horrible Ronald McDonald uh, uh, adage, uh, everything is upsized these days, we're now up to 20, 21,000 TU. What will happen to the sort of the twixt and tween size of the 10 to 12,000 TU? Are those vessels going to be somewhat defunct now going forward? I think size, Andrea, you asked the question, what would be the limit in terms of size? I think technology would suggest that there is really no limit. So in a sense, uh, there's always an economic value in terms of size. I think if you overbuild size, maybe your uh, benefit diminishes you know, on a unit basis. I have not looked into that yet. I suspect that's the case. But on the other hand, it is very much constrained by the shore side operation. Uh, if we look at transatlantic service, you have Europe that can cater to big ships, but in the United States, I think it's still uh, rather constrained. So currently, I think the big ones serving the transatlantic service is about 8,000 TU size. And sometimes you might have to light low. So in the sense that you are able to use big ship for the trade that can accommodate them, 
and you have economic benefit. And smaller ship would then cascade down to another trade. And to the extent, if we look at the Asia region, many companies are using 8,000 to 10,000 TUSI ship as feeder ships now. So as long as the port facility caters to that size, I think ultimately you'll be able to develop a trade. With ships that are maybe the wrong size and fall betwixt and between or, or the wrong fuel efficiency for trading but too young to scrap, what is your advice to ship owners who are holding them or to banks who have them in their portfolio? You know, these sort of uh, ships that are a lost generation. But you know, most of the ships are still running. You know, few are laid up. So smaller ship, less efficient, probably trade in near sea, you know, where you know, the speed is not all that important and therefore bunker consumption is not an important element. You know. And if you have two bigger ships, you probably light load a bit because maybe the draft is not there. Maybe you, know, the, uh, you have a physical constraint. You know. So in each trade, there is a size limit. And as we have bigger ship, the next big ship is displaced will go to another tray and there, so on and so forth. Yeah. Cascading down. Yeah. I, I want to jump back to a macro question because I think we, we need to take advantage of uh, having an elder statesman on the, on the uh, stage and, and uh, you know, an experienced business person like yourself. Um, China, the Maritime Silk Road and AIIB that you mentioned. One school of thought says, you know, this is fantastic, helping to boost the global economy. Another school of thought says this is neo-colonialism, uh, it's a land grab and an attempt to sort of uh, try to take hold of the economic reins for the region. How should we be thinking about uh, these recent announcements? Um, how, how do you frame it uh, in terms of geopolitics? I think... <laughs> Your last phrase, geopolitics, really answers it. You know? uh, I think two sides to a coin. One side is politics, the other side is uh, economics. So if you are looking at Silk Road, uh, One Belt, One Road uh, initiative as purely trying to develop the regional economy, then I think it's good for everybody. You know, whether uh, the country uh, that's touched by Silk Road does not have the financial means to build up the infrastructure, and now you have the financial means because of AIIB or Briggs Bank or Silk, uh, Silk Road uh, uh, funds, uh, then you know, as long as that actually uh, able to uh, lead the way for economic growth, then I think it's good. You know. If I think you believe it is a politically motivated you know, project, then I think A, it will not succeed, B, I think it's not good. You know. so. and, and for countries in the region which are nervous geopolitically or even in dispute uh, over islands and so on, um, but see the economic benefits of close integration, how do you think, where do you think that lands uh, in terms of their reaction and thinking? I think that comes under the title of geopolitics. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm afraid I won't be able to answer you. <laughs> okay, being careful on that one. Um, actually, closer to time, I had one more question, and since we're on the topic of countries, how do you see the competition between Hong Kong and Singapore in the maritime sector? I told you we'd ask tough no, questions, no. right? <laughs> we don't want to let him off. I, 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 I would like to take the uh, opportunity to compliment our Singaporean friends, you know, especially Minister Tu is here. Uh, I, I'm very impressed with the, you know, the building of the port, you know, uh, in a way that you anticipate, you know, the future. Uh, growth plan. Growth plan in the sense that uh, 
for infrastructure projects, I think it would be exceedingly, exceedingly difficult for private sector to enter because when return, we are looking at takes 10, 15, 20 years to come by. And you know, in between, there could be a lot of risk. And for government, it is because of developing the economy. You know. And shipping, and as well as container trade, uh, be it as a transshipment port, is very important to Singapore's economy. And therefore, uh, the country recognized the need to go forward. And the new plan is to build ultimately a capacity that doubles the current capacity. And if I remember, it's somewhere around 65 to 70 million TU capacity. Now, we talk about the big ships. The big ships operating mode requires a lot of transshipment, you know, support network. And if Singapore can actually look into the future, and if this big ships is coming here to stay, then the tr transshipment operation is really the key of success of shipping company, success of efficient operation in international trade, and therefore having this facility is all that important. And relatively speaking, I think no other country or no other neighboring ports is actually contemplating of investing and trying to catch up. So Singapore is actually, with this project, you are actually pulling away from all your competition. And then we stand out to be one and only and able to consolidate your position further. So congratulations with this forward thinking you know, plans. I think we have time for one more question from the, from the floor. Uh, yes, over here. Good afternoon. I am Thomas Derby of uh, Cleanship in Copenhagen. My question uh, to you is uh, about the freight forwarders in the shipping industry. I believe that the uh, result for the shipping lines has not been overly good for the last years. At the same time, we have seen freight forwarders making money even in the years where it has been very poor for the shipping lines. So have you given up control of your own markets or what has been going on? I, I think uh, the freight forwarder and NVOCC are uh, the envy of our industry. Exactly what you described, very little capital and they make very substantial profit. And it is on the back of shipping line that we allow them and a enable them to make that kind of profit. Now I think many shipping line is also trying to break into that market. But I think few or I would even say none of us are successful. So the question is, how do we try to work with free forwarder? And again, I would suggest that if we know our costs, I think we can price more intelligently. And very often, free forwarder is trying to take advantage of many liner company because of complexity of our operation, does not really know our cause, and therefore, you know, being able to achieve the freight rate that is even below cost to the shipping line. And when they go out and market to the retailer, you know, the, of their customer, they can actually charge you quite a hefty premium. Yeah. So, hats off to them. So that brings me to my, my last question. You're talking about um, an adjacent sector which has been doing very well. Actually, OIL has done very well in ports and in real estate in the past. In fact, uh, perhaps the returns have been even more interesting than in the liner shipping segment. Um, if you could start your career again, would you go into shipping and... <laughs> Before you answer that, we've been talking a lot about encouraging young people to our industry, so choose your words with care. <laughs> well, Andrew, I don't have to choose my words, and I think if I have to do it again, I do exactly what I do, provided if we still have the you know, uh, activities that we had before, namely you know, uh, in a successful diversification into terminal real estate, 
allow us any time we wish to come back to the core business, we can dispose them for profit. And that is very important. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So keep some things on the side yeah. just uh, in case you need it. Thank you very much. Uh, very insightful talk and, and comments ranging from uh, big picture economic questions to contain industry, dynamics, future technology. Uh, and we really appreciate you taking the time to share all those insights with us today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Please remain on stage. Big round of applause to thank Mr. Tong for delivering the ninth Singapore Maritime Lecture and to Mrs. So Wen Pao for moderating the session. Now may we now invite on stage our host, Mrs. Josephine Teo, to present a token of appreciation to our speaker, Mr. Tong. Mrs. Teo, please. Big round of applause there. <laughs> Minister Teo and Mr. Tong, please remain on stage. Please remain on stage. And now let's invite Chairman, Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore, Mr. Lucian Wong, to join.